Welcome everyone to our webinar on using museum and herbarium specimen data in ecology, evolution, and conservation. My name is Adam Smith, and on behalf of our co-presenters, Drs. Kelly Erickson and Stephen Murphy, we welcome you to our webinar. Um, this is this is actually what we look like right now. Uh, we, there's absolutely no way we would be sitting in our living rooms or bedrooms wearing our pajamas doing this webinar. Um, that said, uh, if you happen to hear the sound of pets, children, or other small mammals in the background, that's just a sign of our times. Um, so I uh, hope everybody is doing uh, well of health. Uh, you can get a copy of the slides here at this URL. You don't have to scramble to copy that down. We'll put it on all subsequent slides or almost all subsequent slides. Um, we've decided not to try to answer questions live. Uh, we think we can answer them better if we have some time to look through the questions, collate similar questions, and then maybe provide links or papers and things like that. So I can see some people are raising their hand. Um, to be honest with you, that's we didn't actually practice that component. This is our first webinar, as for many people in the world right now are kind of uh, getting up to speed on how to do this sort of thing. So um, I apologize, but we're not going to try to answer the, the hands that are raised. But if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and uh, we will post the answers at this URL by tomorrow. So why have a webinar on museum and herbarium data? After all, it's, it's fairly easy to download. And if you were to do that and proceed with whatever analysis you're interested in, it would appear to be fairly easy. And yet, to be honest, you would be basing, more, more than likely, basing your analysis on uh, data that was unreliable. So museum and herbarium data can be excessively messy. It's really startling. And that's not to say that these are worthless collections or anything like that. After all, these collections form the basis of our understanding of biodiversity, and people have spent cumulatively probably thousands of years collecting this stuff, usually not for the purposes of analysis in ecology or evolution or conservation. So it's not necessarily uh, fit for our purpose, but often we are adopting it for our purposes. Therefore, to our um, eyes, it appears fairly messy. Given that, data cleaning can take up a lot of time of an analysis, and it's really underappreciated. Quite often, I'll have people contact me at the Missouri Botanical Garden where I work, and they'll say, uh, hey, I'm going to be visiting the garden for about two months, and I'm going to be doing this project in the herbarium uh, on these 50 species in this family, and then I'm going to have about two weeks at the end, I'd like to do some species distribution modeling. And my reply is, great, you're welcome to come, but please don't underestimate the amount of time that will take. You'll probably spend a month or so cleaning up the data, and then if there's time left, we can get onto the species distribution modeling. So our goal for this webinar today is not to provide you a step-by-step how-to. There'll be a little bit of that, but honestly, it would take a full day, maybe a two-day seminar to show you step-by-step how-to do things. Rather, we want to provide you entry points into acquiring the data, cleaning data, and then processing and reporting it. And uh, for the most part, that'll get you about 80% of the way. You can probably fill in the rest yourself fairly easily. So this is an outline of our webinar today. I'm taking it off, obviously, uh, from the start. Uh, I'm going to cover really briefly the uses of biodiversity data, how it's generated, and what that means for the kind of um, data that we get when we download specimen data, and then uh, how to actually acquire from various biodiversity data portals. And then Kelly will take it over with uh, tips and tricks on how to clean the data. Stephen will be talking about spatial issues, georeferencing, things like that. And then finally, I'll, I'll end it up. So uh, biodiversity specimen data is commonly used in ecology, conservation, and evolution for various types of analyses. For example, uh, global change sort of investigations commonly use this data as the base input to species distribution models and similar analyses. Uh, in evolution, we're often interested in niche overlap or niche conservatism and stability, and a lot of the base data for that comes from museums. Um, in macroecology, we're often in interested in species richness, and again, a lot of that data comes from collections. And then more and more, collections are often used directly to ascertain past and current rates of, say, herbivory, uh, pollution loads, pathogens, and things like that. And all of these come down to the veracity of the specimen data. So uh, 
I don't want to be insulting, but I do want to make sure that we're all starting on the same level in terms of understanding what a biodiversity specimen record is. And even if you're familiar with this, I think it's generally not so appreciated why and how data types can vary according to the taxa that you're looking at. So I'm going to start with plants. In some sense, plants have it best because they're typically preserved as a dried and pressed specimen on a sheet of paper and that sheet of paper usually gives plenty of room for describing something about the collection. Not that it always is, but usually there's plenty of room. So this is a great, uh, a great specimen. Um, has a species name, a description of the locality, uh, other species that are associated with it, uh, something about this particular specimen, something about the habitat, when it was collected, and who collected it. And it's not to say, again, that all specimens are going to have this data, but many of them do, at least especially uh, more modern specimens. The only thing missing from the specimen tag or label is uh, 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 latitude and longitude. Insects are similar and yet different. Um, again, they'll have some sort of taxonomic information, and yet for many insects, you will not have a species name or even, even a family name. Uh, sometimes they even just go down to the level of order or something like that. Um, typically have some sort of description of locality, maybe coordinates, maybe a place name, something like that. Uh, the date of collection, the collector, more modern records would tend to have some sort of note about how it's collected, for example, in a malaise trap or sweep net or something like that. Um, there might be some comments about habitat or the host or whatever. But um, again, this would be like your ideal specimen record and most specimen records will not have this. Uh, larger animals are preserved in a slightly different fashion depending on the taxon. So reptiles and amphibians tend to be pickled in formaldehyde or alcohol. Um, mammals, you tend to have the skin and then the skull um, uh, associated with it. And then birds, you also have a tag tied usually to the leg or something like that. So you can see that on these kinds of tags, there is just physically usually less space. And sometimes, due to that reason, uh, there's less information recorded on them. Um, sometimes you'll have measurements taken at the time of uh, collection. Sometimes you won't. Um, whatever it is, whatever data is available here is typically entered in the biodiversity specimen data uh, database. Now, it is possible and highly recommended um, when these things get digitized to go to the original collection notes. And this is probably most important for larger animals uh, because those tags are so small. So this is what um, field notes might look like for some animals. This is for a bird, it gives wing length and um, other measurements. Uh, this is another uh, field note. So here we have the collection number for this collector for each one, row represents a different bird. Here's the species, here's the sex, here's the location of collection, and then this is the date. Um, and notice the location of collection is just a verbal description and there's no latitude and longitude. And yet the one above it does have a latitude and longitude. Um, so again, you'll get different information from the same collector for different specimens. So that is all to say why it's very common when you're looking through a biodiversity data database as to why some of those fields or many of those fields contain empty information. It's just not recorded, or perhaps it's in a field notebook, but the person didn't have access to the notebook when they were digitizing the data or something like that. There are also a lot of issues with errors that you'll be seeing in uh, the rest of the presentation, and it's important to understand where those errors come from. So obviously, in part, the errors can be introduced by the actual collector, uh, but they can also be introduced by other people working on the same specimen. So what's generally unappreciated is that a specimen record is often the project of, product of many people, many of whom may not even have communicated with each other or even uh, lived at the exact same time. So here's an example given, again, an herbarium record. This is collected by F. V. Haydn. Um, when it was collected, it was collected in July of either 1853 or 1854. We don't know which year. There's another part of the specimen that says July 19th, so it's July 19th of 1853 or 1854. Um, the first species name given to the specimen, to be honest with you, I can't read that, but then it was renamed in 1928 to this species name, and then in the 1950s, it was renamed to this species. And so when somebody comes across this record and digitizes it, 
hopefully they will notice that this is the most recent uh, uh, species name and they'll input this one. Not to say that the species hasn't been renamed or reassigned since then, but this is what they've got. Um, where was it collected? Well, apparently in Nebraska. Uh, and the exact locality, to be honest with you, I couldn't read that. I had to look it up in our database, but it says Loop Fork. If you Google that, you'll find it's part of the Platte River in Nebraska. Um, and then this is how it's represented in our database in, uh, in Tropicos at the Missouri Botanical Garden. So it was collected in the United States, in Nebraska. They figured out it was in Sheridan County. I don't know if Sheridan County was in existence then, but it is now, so they put in Sheridan County. It has coordinates, but as you can see, Loop Fork and any other kind of description doesn't have any coordinates um, indicated. So somebody had to figure out where Loop Fork was and assign the coordinates. In our database, because these are proximate coordinates, it's surrounded by square brackets, and somehow they figured out the collection was performed in 1853. Um, uh, I hope that they went back to the original expedition notes and figured out it was 1853, not 1854. It's also possible that there are other specimens collected in the same area by the same person and it was unequivocally 1853, so they inferred that. But again, um, a lot of this information has to be inferred or at least interpreted correctly in order for the record to be represented correctly in the database. Now, interestingly, this record is represented in Tropicos, our database, and it's also represented in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility database. Uh, and in that database, the coordinates were not transferred over, I think in part because um, the coordinates as we represent them are, in a, in a, are inexact. And so GBIF has decided not to, to pull those coordinates over. So same record, but different databases and different kinds of information you'll get about the record. So where can you get this kind of data? Well, there's really good news and there's really bad news. The really good news is that there are probably hundreds of online biodiversity data portals. The really bad news is that there are probably hundreds of online biodiversity data portals and you have to figure out which ones you're gonna look for. So you can categorize them and that helps at least in part to figure out which ones you should search for. So some of them are place-based, for example, Canadensis focuses on organisms in Canada, uh, bison in the United States. Uh, of course, there are other ones for different regions and different countries of the world. Some of the biodiversity databases are system-based, for example, freshwater systems or marine systems. Some of them are taxon-based, so Tropicos is our database at the Missouri Botanical Gardens, obviously focuses on plants. Um, Malacolog focuses on mollusks, fish base, obviously on fish. Some of them are professionally uh, populated by professional taxonomists and collectors. Some of them are populated by citizen scientists. Probably the two most famous would be iNaturalist and eBird. So the downside of this obviously is that there are a lot of these, like I said, several hundred most likely. The upside is that there are these aggregator databases and the idea or the theory is that you should be able to search one of these aggregators and these aggregators pull data from these various other databases. So you should be able, in theory, to get everything from one of these that you would if you were to see, search each of these individually. And this said, some of these I listed down here are themselves aggregators. So um, it's honestly a very incestuous kind of ecosystem. And to make it all even more complicated, there are aggregators of aggregators. So BN, for example, aggregates or takes some data from GBIF, which in turn takes some data from Bison, which in turn is an aggregator of other primary databases. So why not just search one of these aggregators? Why not go, uh, that is why, why just look, why, why go and look at these other databases when you can actually look at an aggregator? Well, a couple reasons. Um, you're more likely to get more information sometimes if you look at the primary databases. Here's just two examples. So Tropicos at the Missouri Botanical Garden, my understanding is even though its data is represented in GBIF, the data has not been updated in GBIF since 2014 due to some sort of technical issue. So if you wanted the latest and greatest on plant data, plant information in Tropicos, you should go to Tropicos and not GBIF. Likewise, as far as I can tell, Butterflies and Moths of North America, which is citizen scientists database, is not represented in GBIF. So if you wanted to study those taxa, you would go here. 
So there's one other aggregator database I want to mention in part because it's becoming um, increasingly used uh, all over by people who are interested in vascular plants of North America, Central America, and South America. And that database is BN, that's B-I-E-N. Um, BN is unique in terms of it being an aggregator. Most aggregator databases do not do any cleaning whatsoever. They don't see that as their job. So if there's an error, they put it upon the original data providers to correct those errors and then upload the corrections to them. BN is a little bit different. They've instituted massive um, automated cleaning of records and they draw from GBIF plus many other different sources. And as a result, you'll have far fewer issues if you're using BN than if you were to use other databases. And they will, that said, they will not eliminate issues, but they will reduce them. However, it still does pay to look at what you can get from other databases. Here's one example. I did a search for Fraxinus pensylvanica, uh, or green ash. It's a common tree in the Eastern US and Canada. And in GBIF, I get about 3,700 records. And you, see, you can see it's kind of spotty. There's, there's some places with large gaps. In BN, I get almost 93,000 records. So uh, it definitely pays to search for BN. And yet, you can see there are these striking gaps in some locations. So this is the state of Kentucky. Most of Kentucky, um, if you take it at face value, is not inhabitable by uh, green ash. And this is Louisiana. There are about five records in it even though there are far more in GBIF. So for some reason, uh, somehow during the automated cleaning process, um, the, uh, these records got purged from BN. So again, it pays to look in several different databases. Um, and there's also one other uh, thing I wanna point out, even though again, BN does a lot of cleaning, errors can still propagate through. So this record down here um, is from Guatemala, uh, and it was, I had to go back to, it actually is a, a record from our database at Tropicos. I had to go back to the original record and you can see it was collected at, um, in this case, it was the city, uh, the city university of San Jose in Guatemala. And so it was most likely a cultivated record. Um, it got introduced from Tropicos to GBIF and then transferred from GBIF probably over to BN and it wasn't clean. So again, just because BN does some cleaning doesn't mean that issues are um, completely missing from this data. So one very valid question you may have is, what biodiversity databases should I seek out? Uh, there are, like I said, there are hundreds of them. Do I have to look for every, you know, in every single one of them? Obviously the answer is no, um, but I would say it really kind of depends on the goals of your study and your data needs. So it definitely pays to search for more search more than one database. But again, it's more like, um, say it's like doing a field experiment. You can always add more plots and initially adding sample size really helps, but after a while there's diminishing returns. So if you're looking for rare species that may or may not be represented in many databases, or if you're looking to fill in gaps in a species range where it hasn't been um, well sampled, then it can really pay to kind of uh, look at many different databases, but otherwise at a certain point you just have to say this is the data I have. So where can you get a list of these biodiversity databases? I wish there were an easy to use accessible list and as far as I know there is not. GBIF has one but there aren't links associated with that list so you have to google every single one. Um, so to help everybody out uh, we've created this uh, opportunistic database of biodiversity databases Right now, it has a list of over 100 biodiversity databases. Um, you can get it from this link. It's a Google Doc, uh, and um, on that Google Doc are other resources. Um, it's constantly being updated. Like I, I just became aware just a day or two ago of another 100 or so that could be imported into this um, Google Doc. So uh, come back and keep visiting, and we'll keep updating it. So. I want to tell you about how to get data from GBIF and for obvious reasons, I'm not saying that GBIF is the end all and, eat and be all, but I think the method for acquiring data from GBIF will illustrate some of the issues you'll encounter not only with GBIF, but with some other biodiversity databases and it'll be very instructive and helpful. 
So uh, to get records from GBIF, you go to gbif.org, you create a login, you will never get any spam from them. Um, you do a search for the species. We're going to look for this species. It's Callispermophilus lateralis. It's a gold ma golden mantled ground squirrel. I'm going to skip some of the screens that you will see because it's very obvious what you would do. I'm just going to highlight the most um, pertinent ones. So once you do your search, you get something that looks like this. On the left side are a bunch of data filters. So you can say, for example, I only want records collected since 1970. I only want records without certain issues. Um, and then you get, in this case, about 13,000 records and you can download them. So it's very tempting to use this filtering tool and it's very helpful to, to do some initial data exploration. But actually, I don't recommend using it to get your final data download. And here's why. Say, for example, you only wanted records collected since 1970. So you click this value, you say 1970 or later, and you'll get a certain number of records. But what GBIF is doing is it's looking in the column that says year and any value that doesn't say 1970, for example, might be empty, is excluded. And so you're automatically going to be excluding some records which may be collected since 1970. And if you looked at other columns, there might be some indication about when it was collected. And so you could kind of backfill that year column and therefore get more data. So what we recommend is actually using this filtering field um, only sporadically and doing the filter filtering once you have acquired the, the, the final data set that you're going to get from that particular portal. So again, you click download and GBIF, you get three different options. Um, species list is like it says. There is the option to download a simplified version of the data. It's very tempting because it's much smaller. However, we highly recommend downloading what's known as the Darwin Core Archive. And unfortunately, it's much larger. Now, I'll tell you about Darwin Core here in a little bit. So the nice thing about GBIF is that for every download you do, you get a DOI. Unfortunately, after a couple months, it will get automatically deleted unless you manually postpone the deletion. The idea being that somebody could use the DOI and hopefully recreate the exact download that, that you use to get your data. If you ever use that data and the DOI in a publication or report or something like that, you can tell GBIF about it and then they will not delete it. It'll be kept in perpetuity. So once you download records or a file from GBIF, it'll be a zip file, a compressed file. You'll get something that looks like this. The file of interest, of most interest, is called occurrence. It's a text file. It's fairly easy to open in Excel or R and Unfortunately, it is fairly easy to overlook some of the issues that might crop up. Um, they are described here. One has to do with the way that R handles web addresses, uh, and one has to do with cases when you have too many rows. Um, in both cases, these can cause some really serious issues, and yet neither R and sometimes neither Excel will give you a warning or an error. In other words, it will seem like everything's right. And if you just look at the first, you know, several hundred rows, it looks like everything right. But somewhere way down there, maybe the um, 5,000th row or something, there's an issue and it will not crop up. And what it does basically is it, it tends to wrap columns. And so like some, some values will get pushed over into adjacent cells. So latitude becomes longitude, longitude becomes something else, but it won't crop up as an error. So I'm not gonna read through these. You can get the slides online or you can watch the recording of this webinar later. Um, since this is particular to GBIF, although I also suspect it would occur in other databases that have URLs in the fields. So it is very tempting to use an R package to download some of this data. And generally, I would recommend that because it helps it to be reproducible. But again, there is an issue if you use an R package to download GBIF data. So there's two packages to get GBIF data. There's RGBIF, and then very handily, there's this other one called Spock which encapsulates RGBIF plus many others. Regardless of whether you use Spock or RGBIF, you'll get this issue that I've been, one of these issues that I've been talking about. And here's the example of that. The name of this column in the data is obviously not http.whatever.nick. Nick is the collector's name. In this case, it was a username. This is citizen science data. And what's happened is that some of the columns got wrapped over. You got some extra columns and maybe some of the cells got wrapped over into the next record. And again, this isn't flagged immediately. 
and uh, you can spend a lot of time cleaning data that is erroneous and not realize this. So please be aware. So we recommend, at least for GBIF, doing the manual download. I don't think this issue is really inherent to these packages. It's something about how the data is sent from GBIF. Um, so uh, you can also find a list of other R packages for downloading these data sets and plus others at this, at this URL. So when you're searching, it pays to keep in mind that species names have changed through time in part because of taxonomic disagreements or taxonomic errors or taxonomic revisions, whatever. Um, there are far more names of plants in the world than there are plant species that we know of. Um, uh, and here's an example, although it's not a plant. Again, this is the golden mantle ground squirrel. The older name is Spermophilus lateralis. The newer name is Callispermophilus lateralis. If I search under the newer name, I get 13,000 records. If I search under the older name, I get 3,500 records. So if I were only to search under one of these names, I would get a subset of the records. So this is an issue for non-plants in GBIF. GBIF has a very handy um, taxonomic name resolution system. So if you're typing in a plant name, it will suggest what you should be using and hopefully get all the records. But again, this hasn't, at least in the last month, been updated for other species. So to alleviate this issue, we recommend searching under all relevant names or using a higher taxon. So this is a ground squirrel. In this case, I would look for the family Skyaridae, get all the squirrels, and then filter down to the exact species that I'm interested in. So a question you may have is, what name should I be looking under? Again, good news, bad news. Good news is that there are a lot of different places on the online where you can find out other names or synonymous names for species. The bad news is that there are a lot of places online where you can find out what these names are. Um, it depends in part on the taxon you're looking at. So for example, these first two obviously deal with plants, Encyclopedia of Life, any species, mammal species of the world with mammals. Catalog of Life purports to represent 95% of known species names. So it's a good place to start. Um, you can also use R packages. Here are two listed. I'm sure there are, there are more. So let's go back to that GBIF download that we did. Um, you'll get a file in the format uh, known as the Darwin Core format. And Darwin Core is a very common format for biodiversity data. GBIF uses it as well as many other biodiversity specimen databases. And even if other databases don't use Darwin Core per se, many of the fields that they have will be similar and the interpretation will be the same. So I'm gonna cover Darwin Core format. And Stephen and Kelly are both going to be referring, re, referring to the Darwin core fields. Again, in any particular database you may download, they may not be called exactly this, but the interpretation will often be someone, something similar. So in Darwin core format and GBIF, you download it. Each row represents a record. Uh, these values are unique to each record. You often get a bunch of fields with um, web addresses, and, and Kelly will show you how you can use those or other um, tricks to get uh, a, maybe a picture of the specimen if it's available or at least some, a better description of the specimen. Um, when it was collected, uh, information about the locality of collection, so country, state, and so on and so forth. A verbal description sometimes if it's available of the lo uh, collection locality. Sometimes you'll get information about longitude and latitude and how certain that is. Many records will not have this data. Um, Again, taxonomic information, the species, family, and so on and so forth. Who collected it? And then the basis of the records. So human observation, meaning typically like a citizen scientist or something like that, or maybe a preserved specimen, or uh, I'm not showing it here, but you can also get fossil records and things like that. And depending on your interest, you may or may not want uh, some or many of these kinds of records. So uh, this is Darwin core format. There are over 200, maybe more uh, fields that are actually in this. So I'm just showing a small subset of probably what are the most pertinent kinds of um, fields in this format. If you're interested in what these fields or other fields actually mean, then you can go to this web address here. There's a glossary for each of these fields. And then here are relevant publications. 
So that wraps up uh, the beginning of this webinar. I'm going to hand it over to Kelly now. Uh, she's going to talk with you about data cleaning and tips and tricks in doing that. And you'll have to bear with us here because we're going to we're obviously not sitting in the same place. We're self-isolating. So I'm going to quit she screen sharing and she's going to take over. Okay. Uh, bear with us as we switch screens. Okay, so now that you've downloaded your, your data, you're ready to move on to the next step, which is um, actually starting to clean your data. And so I think it's a really good idea to remember where your data actually came from. Um, and so there's different sources of data which may have different issues associated with them. So um, on one hand, there's citizen science data, which likely has coordinates, although they may have been fuzzed at the user's request. Um, they're definitely opportunistic sampling. And um, if they are coming from iNaturalist, um, the ones that are on GBIF are research grade specimens. And what that means is that they have coordinates, they have a date, um, they have to have photos or sounds, they are not captive or cultivated, and the community agrees on species level ID or lower. Um, on the other hand, you have preserved specimens and like Adam mentioned, um, it's highly possible that there's a disconnect between when the specimen was collected, maybe when the labels were affixed to the um, collection and when it was digitized. And these may all be done by different people along the way. Um, it's also possible that coordinates are assigned at a later date. Um, there are definitely records um, out there that are missing a precise date or location. They may be cultivated or captive. Um, it may be incorrectly labeled. And it's good to remember that just like the citizen science data, they're collected for a variety of different reasons, which are not necessarily aligned with your study. Um, uh, as Adam mentioned, um, GBIF does have these data quality flags, and probably other um, databases that I'm not talking about have these as well. There's a um, GitHub repository um, that iDigBio maintains. It has um, sort of all of these flags that um, GBIF uses. Um, I've listed a couple here. Um, so one is um, a really common thing is if sometimes people input um, records without coordinates, they assign them zero, zero values. Um, you know, kind of not understanding the difference between an NA and a zero, a true zero. Um, it also will flag um, potential um, issues with the coordinates. So maybe the um, latitude and longitude are similar or that the geographic coordinate contains a low precision value. Um, but here I do want to emphasize, be cautious. Um, just because data is flagged doesn't necessarily mean there's an issue that you shouldn't use and vice versa. There might also be data that hasn't been flagged but you definitely shouldn't use um, because there are issues with it. And so this is why we recommend looking at these flags after you've um, downloaded it and not downloading only the, the data without flags. Um, so one thing that um, is commonly done is for people to, to remove unnatural or erroneous uh, records. And so this is where you really have to think about what is your research question. Um, and so um, that can help you decide whether you want to remove cultivated specimens um, so for example, here's an example of a giraffe. Um, and then if we look further into um, different fields, we see from the occurrence remarks, we have a name for this giraffe. It's named Kristen. Um, she was born in April 2002, died in 2014. And we can see that um, it was recorded by the San Francisco Zoo and the coordinates given are within the San Francisco Zoo. And so this is, um, Definitely, we wouldn't want to use a specimen if you're trying to do a species distribution map of where, um, which habitats are preferential for giraffes. Um, and so this is, depending on taxa, sort of where you find um, these um, helpful context clues about whether this specimen is from cultivation or captivity, that can kind of vary. Um, the tip is to look for strings in related fields, um, such as cultivated or zoo or purchased garden, greenhouse, et cetera, also using all different languages that might be um, spoken in the area that you are um, studying. Another question is whether or not to include invasive species in your study. Again, this depends on what your research question is. And um, 
Another thing to watch out for is if you have terrestrial specimens that are appearing in water or vice versa, then you want to pay um, special attention to coasts here, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, another spatial issue that crops up is um, that um, coordinates of sensitive specimens may be fuzzed or redacted, and this is for a very good reason. Um, a lot of um, organisms that are threatened in the wild are, are threatened due to poaching, and so um, uh, collections data have recognized their role in protecting um, sensitive specimens by obscuring their locality data. Um, but as a researcher, you can often uh, track down the original data source and ask them for the original data. Um, so here's an example of what uh, redacted data looks like. So here's a citizen science observation of a um, hellbender salamander. You can see that the um, location has been obscured, so it's um, found in North Carolina, um, but the exact precise coordinate has been removed. Um, and here's an example of a herbarium sheet where um, when they digitize the specimen, they um, obscure the locality data. Although if you were to actually go to the herbarium and visit the specimen, you would likely be able to recover the actual coordinate or additional locality information for the specimen. And I do want to point out that, um, you know, different institutions have their own policies for this, and sometimes it's um, mistakenly applied. So for example, I work with invasive species, um, and I've had several invasive species herbarium sheets that have been redacted, even though the specimen is definitely not a, a threatened um, taxa. So just keep in mind that you may have um, some occurrence records that appear like they don't have any data, but you actually do contact the original um, data host. You can um, find additional information about locality. Um, other spatial if issues, uh, um, depending on um, how they're georeferenced, um, they may have been georeferenced to the centroid of a county or state polygon. Um, as I mentioned before, many specimens have been arbitrarily assigned coordinates to zero, 0, so it's actually jokingly known as the most biodiverse um, hotspot in the world. Um, so, for example, there's over a million occurrences in GBIF, and you can see here it's in the middle of the ocean. So it's possible some of these are actually legitimate, just likely that most of them are not. Um, and then again, coordinates may have been entered incorrectly, the positive and negative signs mixed up, or the latitude and longitude switched. Um, another issue um, is if you're working with specimens that are found along the coast, whether it's uh, terrestrial species or aquatic species, um, different spatial polygons that people use have different boundaries. So here is an example of two. So I have one plotted in the background is the map that has the um, land and the sea, and then I have superimposed over that a red polygon that is a different shaped polygon for the same area. And you can see that um, the red polygon is a little bit um, smoother. It's kind of oversimplified some of these coastal regions. And so if someone was using that to um, georeference a, a specimen that said it was found on the coastline, you know, it could possibly put it in a different spot. Um, and so it's just really, I guess, important to um, pay attention to whether this is actually a, an erroneous record or um, if it is um, fine to use. And there are some helpful tools in R. Um, I'm just going to point out two of them. One is Coordinate Cleaner. And so this can help identify potentially problematic records. Um, so it actually um, will um, locate records that are suspiciously located at centroids of um, spatial polygons. Um, it will flag records that are in the sea, within city limits, um, zero coordinates, and it also has a, um, a database of biodiversity institutions. And so um, if you want to exclude coordinates that are found within biodiversity institutions, so for example, um, if you don't want to use records of a plant that are growing in a botanical garden, for example, you could use this to filter it. But um, be cautious because there might be cases where, for example, if you're studying lizards, where if you found a lizard that was in a herbarium, I mean, sorry, that was in a um, botanical garden, maybe you'd still want to use that record. So it is always important along the way to keep track, um, make sure that functions are doing what you think they are and that you understand what's going on. Um, another package is Scrub R. Um, and so this actually helps with some deduplication issues, which I'll get to into a minute, what, de what du duplication is. Um, it also has functions that can help you identify problematic records. 
There are some functions related to taxonomic name-based cleaning and habitat filtering. And I posted a couple of links here. So one is the um, CRAN page, and then I've also posted some tutorials um, that are associated with these packages. Okay, so um, obviously in the data cleaning process, one of the most helpful things is to be able to actually go back to the original occurrence record and look at either the specimen sheet um, or the original label. And so on GBIF, um, so if you have downloaded the Darwin Core data, the first column um, on GBIF will be this GBIF ID. And um, what you can do is you can copy that and then you enter it into this address, um, gbif.org slash occurrence slash, and then you input your occurrence ID. And then it will pull up um, the GBIF page for that specimen. And oftentimes it will have an actual picture of the specimen or multiple pictures if it's um, something like mammals where they often have many different um, you know, parts that are collected um, and stored in different locations potentially. Um, and here I do want to note that um, if there isn't a photograph of specimen sheet on GBIS, you can sometimes track it down by going to the original institution that hosts the data, um, sorry, that hosts the specimen. And um, they may have uh, digitized their collection, but it hasn't yet made it onto GBIF. Um, and so I've actually been able to track down several records that were actually in local herbarium websites, but not yet on GBIF. Uh, here's an example of what a citizen science uh, record looks like. So here, um, when you pull up the GBIF page, um, or even if you just have the reference column in your spreadsheet, you can click on that and it will open up the record in iNaturalist. And then you can look and see, okay, here's the actual image that the person took. Um, you can see where they found it, how many other records they've, they've collected, and you can click through and, and check out um, everything that you want to know about the specimen. Okay, so duplication is an issue that is more of a problem in plants. I don't think it really happens in other taxa, um, although I could be wrong. Um, but it definitely isn't, it happens with plant specimens. And so um, this is, um, of course, by um, design. So uh, often a collector of this, uh, that's making a specimen sheet will collect um, multiple, um, uh, make, make multiple specimen sheets from the same specimen. And um, so each collector has their own um, numbering series. And so here's one collected by William Gillis. Um, so this is a 7,607th specimen that he collected. Um, one thing you'll notice is that all these, these three specimens have the same record number, they're the same record, but they have different names. And so what's happened is that at some point, the name has been reassigned, um, likely this, this new name, Passiflora miniata, um, but you'll notice that the other two specimen sheets haven't been updated yet. And it's possible that um, you know, when the person made the designation of this new species, that they were able to connect it back to the other two specimen sheets, but also it's also likely that that hasn't happened. Um, and even if they have done that, you know, it takes a while for that to filter up to GBIF. Um, and so this is just something to keep in mind that there are duplicates out there and that they may sort of like once a duplicate is made, once a specimen sheet, like each one has their own sort of independent history of what happens to them throughout the digitization process. A really common uh, issue in collection data is the um, year. Um, and so this, especially if you are wanting to link your occurrence record with um, some climactic data, that it's really important to know, match up the right year with um, when your specimen was present and collected. Um, so here's an example of a label. It says May 18th and 20th, 1917, but actually online um, in the, uh, when it was digitized, it was entered as 2017 incorrectly. And then this also happens, there's some specimen sheets where, um, you know, they just wrote um, hypothesis, or sorry, um, 17 or 18, assuming that people would know because when they made the specimen label, of course it's 1817, or of course it's 1917. But whoever was entering the data assumed it was their current century. So you can have records that are actually several centuries off from what they actually, when they actually were collected just because of issues like that. 
Another thing, again, this is more common with plants because I think um, it, this isn't as common of a practice with other taxa, um, but in plants you definitely have the collection label um, over here in the right corner, and then they do track the history of um, how it was renamed through time. And so here, again, this is uh, William Gillis. He was alive between 1933 and 1979, although he has a record um, in GBIF that um, was as recent as 2015. So obviously this isn't right. Um, you know, it's well after he's died. And so where did that issue come from? Well, if we go back at the specimen, we can see that it was indeed collected in 1970, but the um, species designation update was done in 2015. And for whatever reason, when this um, specimen was being digitized, that's the, um, the date that made it into the year field, even though it should have been 1970. And so, um, you know, this can be overwhelming to think about that there's a lot of these issues out there. But um, a really quick way of trying to track these down is if you look at um, individual collectors and you look at the range of years of the specimens that you have, you're probably going to find some that are really unlikely, like someone who is collecting for 200 years. And so that's a really good way to, you know, pick up some of these records that are obviously incorrect. Another really common issue, probably the most common, is addressing misspellings and alternate forms of writing the same thing. So basically any field where someone had to type in text introduces the possibility for misspellings or alternate ways of writing the same thing. Um, so for example, in your raw data, you might have all these different ways of writing Miami-Dade County. Um, in your clean data, you want it to say something else, um, maybe matching up with how counties are designated in your environmental data. And so um, this is an important data cleaning step. Another thing is to um, possibly you need to think about how your NAs are, are um, cleaned. So for example, um, uh, someone may have written down, oh, okay, this was illegible, or the same thing in Spanish, no disponible, or missing, um, or something like that. And um, you know, R doesn't know that that's an that should be an NA, you have to tell it that it's an NA. So you want to make sure you clean up, you look for some of these things where they should be NAs, but they aren't, they're labeled as something else. Um, uh, there's a function icon V that can help you deal with diacritical marks, um, which R kind of struggles with. Um, and then another thing to do is if you have coordinates, plot them to see if they fall in the same county that's listed. And you might want to look at the date too, because it's possible that maybe the location has changed, um, you know, as county boundaries have changed over many years. Um, but it's something that you can definitely follow up on. And a useful tool for handling misspellings um, is this open source program called OpenRefine. And um, if you, for any column that you want to sort of merge, um, values that are um, likely to be the same. There's this cluster and edit function. And um, so here it will, you can actually go through several different algorithms to group and merge data that are probably the same values. So for example, here's Liberty and Liberty. But the only difference is that one is capitalized and the other isn't. Um, so they really should be the same. And so I posted, um, here's the link to the program. And then there's also a data carpentry workshop that actually goes in far more detail on using OpenRefine. Um, particularly for ecology. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen, who's going to talk about um, spatial locality issues. So bear with us again as we um, switch over. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me um, and see my screen here. Um, so up until this point, we have um, primarily been talking about uh, sort of general data cleaning issues and um, issues related to um, specimen and museum and herbarium records in general. Um, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into something that Kelly um, talked a little bit about, which is um, understanding some of the um, issues and problems associated with the spatial information that's associated with specimen records. Um, and I'm really going to be talking about two separate things here. Um, one I'll, I'll call locality certain uncertainty. I also might call this 
positional uncertainty or spatial uncertainty. Um, and then hopefully I'll also get, be able to, to talk a little bit about um, the process of georeferencing itself. Um, and just in case anybody is unfamiliar with um, georeferencing, by that I just mean um, sort of translating the uh, textual information that you'll see on some of those tests and labels into things like latitude and longitude coordinates. Um, and the reason that this uh, topic is so important and it's so important to sort of um, understand what the quality of the spatial information associated with the record is, um, is because if you're doing something like a species distribution model, uh, you're going to be interested in actually linking uh, climate variables or some other uh, relevant predictor variables um, to your individual specimen records. And so if you have um, imprecise information on the spatial location of your records, um, it's potentially going to be really difficult to um, actually uh, link those variables up to your records. Um, and so I just want to start with a sort of simple example here. Um, if you um, sort of imagine um, that we're looking at sort of um, counties and provinces in North America, so this is just uh, Mexico, the United States, and Canada here. Um, what this figure is showing is it's showing um, uh, how much variability in annual precipitation um, is occurring within each one of these counties or in, in province, provinces. Um, and so what you can see right away is that for the most part, um, in the eastern half um, of the United States, for example, there's relatively low variation. Uh, but you can see in some of these counties, particularly in the larger counties, uh, and then in some of these areas up here uh, in the Pacific Northwest, you actually get huge ranges in annual precipitation. And, and this is true for uh, most climate variables as well. And so if we actually just zoomed in on one of these uh, counties that's listed in red here, uh, we can see that annual precipitation actually varies from less than 1,000 millimeters per year uh, to over 4,000 millimeters per year. So you, you can imagine um, if you had a record that was just assigned to one of these counties and you didn't have any further spatial information on them, um, it's, it's fairly likely um, that you'll run into problems if you're doing something like um, a species distribution model. Um, so what I want to do now is um, I just want to switch over to um, an Excel spreadsheet, and ho hopefully everybody sees this switching. Um, if there's any problems with that, just um, send me a note in the chat here. Um, but what this is, is this is an example of that occurrence.txt file that Adam mentioned earlier. This is what you'll get uh, if you download that Darwin Core format from GBIF, um, or if you have any other Darwin Core formatted um, file from the database. It'll look something like this. I have moved some of these uh, columns around just for illustrative purposes, um, but for the most part, this is, this is what you'll get. Um, and this will look pretty similar. Um, if, you, if you've worked with uh, biodiversity databases before, obviously you'll have um, a list of, of individuals that are associated with the species. Um, hopefully you'll have some sort of information on uh, the country, state, and county that, was, that it was collected in. And if you have worked with this type of data before, um, you'll probably notice that in a lot of cases, um, some records have latitude and longitude coordinates and some records don't. Um, which you can see that is the case here. So these first three records um, have latitude and longitude coordinates. But if you just kind of scroll through these data, uh, you can see that most of these rows are actually empty, meaning that they don't have um, any spatial coordinates associated with them. So I think a common assumption um, particular for people who are coming at these data for the first time, um, is that the records that have latitude and longitude coordinates are quote unquote precise records or have good spatial information, uh, and while the records that don't have latitude and longitude coordinates um, lack that type of information. And I want to talk a little bit about why that's not necessarily um, the case, um, and why it's not the case in, in, in both situations. So you can have you can have records that have latitude and longitude coordinates that actually aren't, um, that don't contain good spatial information, um, and you can have uh, records that don't have latitude and longitude coordinates that potentially do have good spatial information if you put in the time to actually georeference them. Um, and so to understand this, it um, is helpful 
to sort of understand where most of this information comes from. Um, so in a lot of cases, it is true that somebody actually went out in the field with a GPS unit and you know, took a waypoint right at an individual specimen. But I would say um, far and away, that's not the case. Um, so in a lot of situations, even if a GPS was used, um, it wasn't necessarily used directly where the specimen was collected. So in a lot of cases, um, this will be for you know, a, a park or something that someone collected a lot of different uh, specimens within. Um, and even more common is that the latitude and longitude coordinates associated with a record were actually obtained from these textual locality strings that we talked about earlier. And so what I have here are two um, examples. On the left is what I would call a modern specimen record um, that was collected in the year 2000. And on the right, we have um, a historical record that was collected in 1812. And so if you look at the, the labels on both of them, you can see that on the left, um, we have really good detailed information about where um, the record was located. So we have actually an address, uh, we have latitude and longitude coordinates, so um, we can be pretty certain about where that individual um, was located. The record on the right, however, um, is just, um, uh, just South Africa, so it doesn't have any other information other than that. So if we were georeferencing um, this specimen, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to give this record any more precision than um, the country of South Africa. Um, and so this is, this is fairly common. So typically older records will have uh, much poorer uh, spatial information associated with them, although that's not always the case. And so another thing that I just wanna uh, point out here, which, which is, is a little bit um, unrelated here, uh, but it is a good uh, example of why it's really important to sort of read some of these labels and actually really um, dig a little bit deeper. So if you read the specimen label, um, it actually appears that this um, specimen was probably collected as a joke uh, by people at the Missouri Botanical Garden because you can see that um, the species, which is dandelion, uh, was purchased at a local farmer's market for uh, $2.99. So someone was selling uh, leaves of dandelion for $3 and someone at the garden decided to uh, make a specimen record. Um, you'll find stuff like this a lot um, in biodiversity databases. Uh, particularly in places like GBIF. So obviously, even though this, this record has good spatial information, it's not necessarily associated with where um, the actual habitat of that species is. So um, just pointing that out, out there, the, the sort of further you dig down into these records, sometimes um, the more of these kinds of um, situations will, will arise. Okay, so I'm gonna switch back to Excel here. Um, Basically, what this means is that the latitude and longitude coordinates themselves aren't enough. So these might represent, again, the centroid of a park, the centroid of South Africa, or wherever um, uh, the record is, is, was collected. What we also need is some measure of the uncertainty in where that point is located. And so fortunately, in GBIF um, and, and a lot of other biodiversity databases, um, that information can be found in this coordinate uncertainty in meters column. Um, so you can see that each of these first three records um, has uh, a measure of coordinate uncertainty here, which ranges from about uh, 500 to uh, 4,500 or so. Um, and so basically this, this tells you um, sort of the uncertainty associated with these points. Um, this, um, I'm not sure if, uh, if I mentioned this, but this, this um, spreadsheet that I ha have open now is for Sclepius records. Um, and if we actually plot out the distribution of these coordinate uncertainty values, it'll look something like this. Um, so this is plotted on the log scale down here, uh, but I just um, sort of threw up this red line here indicating where 10,000 meters is. So that you can see for, mo for most cases, um, the coordinate uncertainty is less than 10,000 meters, um, but um, quite a few records have really, really uh, large uncertainty values as well. And so if you actually threw these up on a map, it would look something like this. So again, um, this is all Asclepius records collected within North America. Um, those uncertainty values are associated with the radiuses of these circles. And so you can see that for the most part, um, these circles are, are relatively small, but in some cases, um, the circles are really, really huge, indicating that um, a record was potentially only georeferenced to say um, all of North America. And actually even here, um, I'm zoomed in just to North America itself. Um, if you actually plot all the records, uh, it'll look something like this, uh, where North America is somewhere right here in the middle, 
Um, some of these records have uncertainty values uh, that are greater than 4 million meters. So um, you can imagine if you were just um, basing an analysis on whether uh, records had or didn't have um, latitude and longitude coordinates, you can see that incorporating some of these records would certainly lead to um, a lot of issues. So it's, it's useful to understand where these numbers come from, so these coordinate uncertainty values, and far and away the most common uh, method for calculating these is, is this point radius method, uh, which is summarized in this paper by Wiecerek, Guo, and Hyman's back in 2004. Um, and the point radius method is, is popular and useful because uh, it's simple to understand, it's simple to calculate, there's online tools available for doing it, um, and it's also just a single number. Again, it's the radius of that circle centered on um, the, 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 the point estimate of where the, the record was located. Um, and so it's easy to, to put into a column like in the Darwin Core format and share across different databases. Another useful thing about the point radius method is that um, it seeks to incorporate a lot of different sources of error. Um, if you go back and read this paper, it, it'll go into detail on all six of these different um, sources of measurement error. Um, I'm not gonna go into great detail on all of these, um, but I'll just sort of briefly skim these. So obviously the size of the place name or place feature. Um, so you know if we're talking about um, a record being collected in Central Park versus New York City. Um, obviously, the one collected within Central Park is going to be much more precise than the one that it was collected in New York City. The geodetic datum used, so you know, whatever datum you use, there's going to be certain um, errors associated with it. Um, if a record has a label that says something like um, the record was collected, um, you know, 10 miles north of wherever, um, there's sources of errors associated with what 10 miles means. Does that mean as the crow flies or along road systems? Also, was it directly north or you know, was it, was it slightly northeast or northwest? Um, so the point radius method seeks to incorporate those kinds of uncertainty. Um, also, the precision um, of your latitude and longitude coordinates or how many decimal places you might have. Uh, and then Kelly was, was mentioning a little bit about you know, precision of maps and stuff like that. So again, the point radius method um, sort of incorporates all of these different sources. So let me just show a quick example here. Um, we'll stick with Central Park here. Um, we can imagine, you know, we collected a plant or something within Central Park. Um, if we were seeking to um, do the point radius method to come up with um, an uncertainty estimate, the first thing we want to do is sort of define the boundary of Central Park. This is something that I just pulled up on uh, OpenStreetMaps, which is a really good tool for um, finding spatial information for um, really an incredible number of different um, place names. So there's things on OpenStreetMap that are much more obscure than, than Central Park. So if you're looking for detailed spatial information on place names, uh, OpenStreetMap is a great resource. So the first thing we want to do is just locate the centroid uh, of Central Park, which is somewhere right here. Uh, and then we would find the maximum distance between that centroid uh, and the boundary. And then if we looked at a circle, it would look something like this. Basically, this circle is um, defining the uncertainty space, I'll call it, for where that record is located. Um, now, of course, this is just incorporating that first source of error, which is the size of Central Park. Um, if we incorporate those five other sources of error, uh, we can expect the circle to be um, a little bit uh, bigger here. So one... Um, Oops. So one thing that I do want to talk a little bit about is um, uncertainty in an offset term. Um, so an, an offset term is just, um, again, something like 10 miles uh, northeast of wherever. Um, I want to show you how the point radius method incorporates um, those offsets. Um, so sticking with our Central Park example, um, if we had a record that said it was collected one mile northeast of Central Park, um, instead of um, looking at the centroid of this place, place name, we would actually shift it uh, one mile directly northeast of Central Park. Um, and if we drew the, uh, the circle associated with that, it would look something like this. And you can notice that this um, circle is quite a bit bigger than the one that I showed before. Uh, and, and again, the reason for that is because once you include that offset term, um, you're incorporating a lot of different sources of error now. 
So we don't know exactly what one mile meant, whether that meant the top of Central Park or the middle of Central Park. Um, again, we don't know whether that meant one mile walking along the path, one, one mile on a map. Um, and we're also not sure how accurate um, the, the collector's estimate of what Northeast meant, meant means as well. So this is, this is a good example of showing sort of the, the benefits of the point radius method, uh, but also sort of some of the disadvantages of it. Um, so the, the good thing about the point radius method, um, in addition to what I mentioned earlier, is that it's highly conservative. Um, so you can, you can be fairly confident that um, if you calculate the point radius method correctly, um, that your point that your, that your record is going to look is going to fall somewhere within that circle. But you can also see that um, there's a lot of areas included within this circle where you're, you can be fairly confident that the record wasn't located. So um, there's areas down here, for example, that are actually south of Central Park. Um, so depending on your application, um, you may require um, greater levels of precision here. So you might actually want to use um, the spatial polygon itself to measure uncertainty. Um, you can also define a function that, that, that potentially um, gives you a probability within this circle of where the record was located. Uh, but both of these methods are a lot more complicated, require a lot more data. And so for the most part, this point radius method um, is really useful in a lot of different um, applications. Okay, so up until this point, I have primarily been talking about situations where um, you're dealing with a record that has um, latitude and longitude coordinates associated with it. I mentioned earlier, um, what do we do about records that don't have this information at all? And even beyond that, uh, what do we do with records that have latitude and longitude coordinates like these, but are missing the information on coordinate uncertainty? And this is actually very common. Um, so if we just sort of keep our eye on these three columns here, um, you can see that for the most part, um, even those records that have latitude and longitude coordinates um, don't have this uncertainty value in meters. So in a lot of cases, if you don't have this measure, um, it's going to be difficult to um, decide whether you can actually incorporate these records into your analysis. Um, and so if you are sort of um, in need for uh, more data, so, if, so for example, if you're doing a species distribution model for a rare species, um, and after filtering by latitude and longitude, and after filtering by um, coordinate uncertainty, you're not coming up with enough records. Um, it might be worthwhile to actually go through the process of georeferencing yourself um, to get some of this information. And so one of the things you can, of course, do is actually go back to the original specimens themselves. Um, but a lot of times that's not possible. Um, and so an additional column that I want to point out um, that's available in GBIF and, and, and any other uh, biodiversity database that uses the Darwin Core format. Um, is this locality column and verbatim locality column. And there's not really a big difference between the two, uh, but it is important to look at both because um, it tends to be that different people who um, put this information into the databases, they tend to use one column or the other. So the reason that this is important is that this actually includes that textual um, descriptions that, that can be found on the specimen labels. Uh, and in a lot of cases, um, these records from GBIF or, or elsewhere uh, will have locality information, even if they don't have uh, latitude and longitude information. So if you actually want to go through the process of georeferencing, you can do that um, if you want to. Now, um, given the short time frame that we have here, um, I'm not going to be able to sort of go through all the details of georeferencing. Georeferencing is a, a fairly big topic, uh, but I do want to just point out um, a couple of um, useful tools and a couple of useful resources um, that I think are um, helpful to people coming at this uh, for the first time. And one of them is a program called Geolocate. Uh, Geolocate is a free web applica application that um, um, you can find here just at geolocate.org. Um, and I'll just show you a quick example of how this can be used. So I'll click this web application tab up here, um, and then I'll click the standard client right here. And I'm going to just type in um, the same example that we used before, which is a record that was collected one mile northeast of Central Park. Okay. Um, if you're dealing with records that were collected in the US, you do have to put in the state where it was collected. 
Um, there's also different ways that you can, you know, you can type northeast instead. Um, Geolocate has, has a bunch of different uh, methods for doing this. Um, and it also is able to actually interpret some of these offset terms, which is really nice. So let's see what happens when we click to your reference. Uh, the first thing that you'll notice, and this is true for most um, text strings that you give to Geolocate, is that it will give you multiple uh, results. Uh, and so that is the case here. We see five different results returned. Um, Geolocate does attempt to give you a uh, quote unquote uh, primary or best result, which is highlighted in green. Uh, but for the most part, I found that um, this doesn't typically return the correct one. Um, and the reason that both of these points are important is that um, geolocate and really any other georeferencing tool uh, should be used um, as an as a tool in um, georeferencing and not as a replacement. So if you're if you're hoping to sort of automatically georeference all of your um, locality information, you're probably um, going to be uh, out of luck if you, if you want to do that. But um, so let's just zoom into where we know this record is located, which is down here in New York City. And you can see that this should look quite familiar. Um, what's, what's nice about geolocate is it goes ahead and it, it calculates that uncertainty for you um, using that point radius method, um, which is shown here, 4,320 meters. You can export all this information. Um, and so this is a really good um, tool for um, aiding in georeferencing. Um, just another a couple of things to point out. You can batch process files. Um, you can give geolocate a CSV file like this. Um, there's also a R script down here. Um, so that you can actually interact with geolocate's API through this R script. Um, one thing I did notice, um, I've, using this in the past, that there's a couple of typos in this script. Um, I've gone through and corrected some of those typos. And um, when we send around the, the, the resources associated with this webinar, um, a corrected uh, version of this um, R script will be um, included as well. So I'm not sure how um, often they actually update this, uh, but that, that is just something to be aware of, I notice. Okay, um, so a couple of other tools. Um, again, georeferencing is a big topic. Um, iDigBio has a lot of great resources, uh, not just for georeferencing, but um, for a lot of different issues associated with digital museum records. Um, so if you go to this georeferencing page, there's a lot of good uh, information here. Uh, iDigBio actually runs um, workshops that they do on georeferencing. Some of those have actually been recorded and put on the web here. So um, it's actually possible to go on here and uh, watch some of those uh, recordings if you're interested in that. Um, obviously, um, georeferencing requires identifying place names. Uh, GeoNames uh, is kind of the gold standard. Um, this has um, literally billions of different place names um, and really sort of obscure things too. So, you know, all of the sort of, um, you know, weird detailed uh, place names that you might find on specimen labels, um, you can likely find them in GeoNames. I also mentioned OpenStreetMaps earlier. Um, one thing to be aware of uh, when using OpenStreetMaps is that um, you can't actually get um, shape files directly from OpenStreetMap, uh, but there's this web, website called GeoFabric, uh, which essentially takes the data from OpenStreetMaps and converts it to um, spatial polygons. Obviously, these files are really large, uh, but if, this, if, if finding these um, spatial polygons for place names is something that you're interested in, um, this GeoFabric website is really, really useful. Um, also, sort of a, a general web page is georeferencing.org, which has a lot of this information. It has um, gazetteers and, and tools and, and, and um, links to other references as well. So um, really, if you are interested in using uh, georeferencing protocols in your research, um, definitely uh, check out some of these different uh, resources. So the final thing that I want to talk about is, um, you know, once you sort of um, understand and have the information, um, then, you know, what are sort of the decisions um, involved with um, um, either um, incorporating the spatial information into a model or using it to sort of filter out um, um, different records. Um, so th there's really two different methods here. Uh, the data level method um, is essentially that filtering. So one of the, you know, probably the most common method um, is to just choose a threshold value for that uncertainty column 
um, below which you say your records are um, spatially accurate and above which you say that they're, they're essentially not. And so um, one uh, method that's commonly used is depending on sort of the resolution of your analysis, the resolution of the climate information that you're incorporating into something like a species distribution model, you'll wanna match the coordinate uncertainty value to those data. So I would say probably 85% of papers use that method. Um, another thing you can do is sort of data averaging. So um, if you have records uh, located to a county, for example, you can potentially use the, the average climate variable, um, but this doesn't really get around the issue that much. Um, however, um, there are some useful tools for just figuring out um, how much of a problem um, these kinds of issues might be. So I just want to point out this USDM package that was put together by Bob Um, And it's really useful for um, essentially calculating the um, spatial autocorrelation in your environment, uh, environmental variables associated with your record. So I showed that map earlier um, of counties and provinces in North America. Um, if you're dealing with records that are primarily in uh, areas where uh, environmental heterogeneity is low, um, then you might not have to worry so much about these, about these kinds of issues. But if you are working with areas that um, have sort of um, huge ranges in terms of um, elevation and climate, um, you definitely have to incorporate this kind of information in some way. So the model and level methods are actually directly incorporating um, uncertainty into the model. Um, these are really useful because it sort of avoids throwing away data. Uh, but at the same time, these methods are definitely um, a lot less developed and are a lot more complicated. And they're a lot more difficult to sort of incorporate into some of the um, more common species distribution modeling techniques like MaxNet, for example. Uh, but those methods are out there um, if it's something that you're interested in. And that's, that's essentially um, what I wanted to talk about here. Um, I think I will just go ahead and give things back over to Adam now. All right, thank you very much, Stephen. So let's say you've undergone this arduous process of cleaning the data. What do you expect to get out of that? Here's an example, and I think it's rather eye-opening. Um, this is an analysis we're conducting right now. We started off with 113,000 records of milkweeds all downloaded from GBIF. Of those, about 1% had a species name that we could not decipher. It was either missing or just a genus name or something like that. 9% um, had a year we couldn't interpret, meaning it was like 18, you're not sure if it's 1918, 1818, or whatever. Um, only half a percent were cultivated or not natural, which doesn't sound like a high percentage, and yet those tended to be uh, geographic outliers and probably environmental outliers. So if we had kept in, if we had included those in the analysis, they probably would have skewed any subsequent um, conclusions. About a third of the records were missing coordinates. That's actually a very low number. Usually it's very high. Uh, about a third of the records had coordinates, but they had no uncertainty. So it wasn't clear if the specimen was georeferenced, say, to the center of a county or a state, or if georeferenced to the actual location of collection. Um, a sizable portion missed, missed some information about the administrative units, which could help you double check those coordinates. Per force, about 3% of the records had coordinates and they had information about the state and maybe the county it was collected in, and yet the coordinates did not follow in the stated state or county or, or whatever it was. And about one eighth of the records were geographic duplicates. So all of these issues here are issues that probably would affect most analyses and would cause most people to either go back into the records and try to correct them or just discard them. There are other kind of filters you uh, would want to apply depending on your interests for your study. In our case, we are interested in records collected since 1970. Um, we were interested in museum and herbarium records, not observational records, so, but other people may be more generous and want to include those. We actually used a very low uh, threshold, or I should say high threshold for the amount of uncertainty we are willing to tolerate for our uses. So typically, this would be a much larger percentage. But the end 
uh, product of what we did, of what we uh, achieved in, in all this data cleaning was winnowing down those 113,000 records to about 17,000. That's about 15% of the data that we retained. And honestly, in my experience, this is actually a fairly high percent. Usually it's around five to 10%. And honestly, that, that's, that's dismal. Like I said at the beginning, these records represent cumulatively thousands of years of people's work. And obviously, they weren't necessarily collecting it for ecologists, but a lot of it can be used for that, but you have to be very careful. Otherwise, your conclusions are going to be based on erroneous data. So it's very tempting, to be honest with you, to, to not do this at all or do it kind of in a very um, haphazard manner and then you know, kind of close your eyes to, to other issues. And if you do that, um, the good news is that you'll be in good company because we have found that only half of the papers that should report or should do some sort of data cleaning actually report any data cleaning. And it's not that the half of the papers that didn't either didn't do it, perhaps they just didn't report it. So this is a, um, a literature analysis we're in the middle of right now. We have 175 articles where people should have been cleaning museum and herbarium data. Like I said, only half of them said they did anything. And sometimes it was just like, we cleaned the data and that was it. So right there, those analyses are simply irreproducible because you don't know exactly how they clean the data. So about a 40% 40, uh, 40 of them mentioned that they removed incorrect records. Um, but not all of them exactly said why or how that was done. So again, it's not reproducible if it's described in a very vague manner. And a smaller percent of them that did remove records stated how they did it. Uh, so they checked for captive or experimental records or uh, spatially imprecise records, geographic outliers and, what, what, and, and so forth. So it's very important to report these things exactly as possible. Obviously it doesn't make for um, scintillating reading, so it would probably go in the supplement, but it helps people to see the process that you use to create the data set that you used in, in your analysis. So this is a minimal list of things we suggest for reporting your analysis. I'm not gonna read through all of these. You can come back to the slide later, either in the recording or actual slides. But one thing I do wanna point out is, if at all possible, try to do your cleaning in code so that it is reproducible. And more than likely, you will, you will have to do some, I'll, I'll call it manual cleaning, but you can encode that. So for example, using a um, case that, that Kelly illustrated earlier, where you have might, might have like Miami-Dade CO, Miami-Dade County, or something like that, you want to you want them all to be Miami hyphen Dade, then you can put that in the code. So if it looks like this, call it that. If it looks like this, call it that. Even though that's kind of manual, it's still coded. So somebody should be able to take your raw data, run it through your script and then get the exact same records that you used for your analysis. So uh, tips and tricks for doing um, your own data cleaning. First of all, when you're looking, look for all, look for, I would say most relevant databases online and otherwise. Um, Check and double check that your automated and manual downloads are, are the same. Otherwise, that might help you flag some issues that wouldn't necessarily create errors. Look for alternative taxonomic names or higher taxonomic names to ensure that you're getting um, all the pertinent records for the species that you're interested in. Once you've got the data, look at all the different fields. Like I said, in, in the Darwin Core Archive, there's over 200 fields. It's a little bit bewildering. But if you look through many of them, you'll find that they actually contain some relevant information. If in doubt, go back to the original specimen record, if at all possible. You can either do that online sometimes, or if you're lucky enough to be associated with a museum or a barium, you can actually physically request these specimens be sent to you. And that's kind of a general common courtesy that people do. Um, so you can actually have them sent to you. You can double check them on the exact uh, specimen. Schedule adequate time. Like we said, it takes a lot of time to clean data and it's highly iterative. Uh, use version control if at all possible, especially if you're doing kind of manual checks and you, like I said, you'll almost have to do that. We highly also recommend um, kind of enumerating the steps along the way using different files. So in this example, file 00 is the raw download. I didn't do anything to it. And then step number two, step number one, I removed records in the ocean. Step number two, I changed uh, state and county name, so on and so forth. We went up to step number 13 in this case, Personally, I've gone up to like step 56. 
Um, they've gotten better through time, but it's highly iterative. And the advantage of this is that if you come across errors later, it's easy to go back to the pertinent step and correct them and go forward versus start here at the raw data. Uh, for example, this analysis that we're doing with Asclepius, the milkweeds, um, a couple of weeks ago, I encountered this record, which maybe or maybe not was a geographic outlier, so I looked into it closer. It happened to be collected at from a bouquet at a wedding, and then I realized it was actually a wedding I attended and officiated that. And no, I did not put it in the database. I would not have done that to you guys. Um, but still, it, it always pays to, um, to, to keep track of your cleaning and uh, make it reproducible, not only for yourself, but others as well. And finally, again, underscore, code the data as much, code the data cleaning as much as possible so it's, so it's reproducible. So thank you very much for listening to our webinar. Um, these slides are already available at this website tomorrow, uh, probably tonight, but at least tomorrow we'll have answers to the questions posted. We also have a recording of the webinar. Also on that website are uh, an SDM workshop, um, list of biodiversity databases, taxonomic name resolution services, georeferencing resources, environmental data, so on and so forth. So please go ahead and check that out. And thank you very much for listening, and I wish you all the best of health.